ओम श्री साई राम प्रशांति संदेश साई पर्ल्स ऑफ विजडम वेलकम्स यू थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर योर टाइम एंड द कीन इंटरेस्ट यू हैव बीन एविंसिंग ऑन दिस पॉडकास्ट ओवर द इयर्स थैंक यू वेरी मच नाउ एज वी नो Bhagwan Baba said don't give any importance to difference of opinion about language religion caste or country develop the feeling that all are children of god always bear the thought there's only one god swami has always been teaching us that all religions are one and the symbol of sri satsai seva organization has symbols of the five main religions inscribed on it this is visible on the sarva dharma stupa at prashantalayam are you aware of how and when this stupa came into existence well 23rd november 1975 was the 50th birthday of bhagwan baba it was the 50th year of the advent of the avatar on earth for the welfare of humanity to commemorate this occasion it was decided that a sarva dharma stupa would be constructed according to swami's instruction a plan was drawn up and the responsibility was interested to brigadier bose he was given a time of only 60 days to complete the task but it was also backed by swami's boundless grace it was swami's wish that the work would be carried out only by the devotees and should not be entrusted to any contractor or laborers it was an arduous task to carry out this work with all the help of skilled laborers but it was made possible because swami's sankalpa the first stage of laying the concrete was carried out by the divine lotus hands of bhagwan baba himself all the office bearers of the central office took part all the several volunteers and the college students also got the opportunity to participate in this project and what seemed impossible at first became possible through bhagwan's grace when the work was in progress one night there was heavy rains brigadier bowls was very worried that all the work done so far would go waste due to the rains next morning he visited the site and to his surprise found that it has rained all over barring the area around the site how god has control over nature during the inaugural ceremony the balvikas children sang several sacred verses from the vedas zend avesta tripitaka bible and the quran while inaugurating the 50 feet tall pillar bearing a lotus on top swami explained that the five petals of the lotus symbolized the five major religions of the world he said ishvara sarva bhutana god exists in all things in all living beings if this truth is realized all differences will be cast aside self realization will dawn everything will be seen as divine to all the devotees belong to different faiths and parts of the world who had gathered there swami said thousands of devotees from different castes 
creeds and religions have come here from all over the world. They are all inspired by one goal. Love brings everyone together. It broadens the heart. All religions teach one and the same thing, love. So no one should give any undue importance to personal differences, hate, selfishness, etc. and tread the spiritual path with faith and courage. Well, there is a story from the year 1962. At this time, Sri P. K. Savant, a generous and pious gentleman, was the Agriculture Minister of Maharashtra. He had also been appointed as the Honorable President of the Shirdi Samsthan. When he heard that Shirdi Sai's reincarnation is now well known as Sri Satya Sai, he got in touch with a devotee of Sri Satya Sai named Sri Lakshmi Das Bhatia. Through him, Sri Savan met Sri Madhav Dikshit, the nephew of late Sri Kaka Sahib Dikshit and Dr. Gadia. From all these people, he heard about Swami's Leelas and his life story. Once, Sri Savant went to Sri Bhatia's house to get some information on Prashant Lane. He saw a long queue outside the door. Out of curiosity, he inquired about it. He was told that Sri Bhatia's old and trusted servant suddenly took ill and with no medical help available, had been wincing in severe pain. At this juncture, Dr. Gadia was inspired to give him vibhuti. He took a pinch of vibhuti, invoked the Swami and put it in the servant's mouth. The servant got completely cured within half an hour. When the news spread, all the servants from the building gathered there to get some vibhuti. Well, just then, Sri Savant reached there. He started insisting that Dr. Gadia should put some vibhuti in his mouth too. Initially, Dr. Gadia was hesitant. He told Sri Savant, I'll give it in your hand. You eat it yourself. But Sri Savant would not agree. And finally, Dr. Gadia had to put the vibhuti in his mouth. This moment was captured by a photographer on his camera. He was part of the car crowd. Now Dr. Gadia was really worried. He thought that if someone showed this photograph to Swami, he might not be pleased. However, when the photograph was given to Dr. Gadia, he was wonderstruck. The picture showed him putting the vibhuti in Sri Savan's mouth and in the background one could see a beam of light from Swami's photo on the wall reaching Mr. Savant. When the photograph was shown to Swami, he said when Dr. Gadia was putting the vibhuti in the Savant's mouth, he thought to himself, will this vibhuti be as effective as the Udi from Shirdi? So I had to immediately clear his doubt. Swami did this Leela only to purify a sadhak's heart. Later, he appointed Sri Savant as a trust member of Sri Sachasai Trust and the president of Prashanti Vidun Mahasabha. We are so fortunate that God has taken a human form and is moving amongst us, taking utmost care that each and every one of us transforms into good human beings. A long time ago, Swami was once explaining to his devotees about meditation. He said, When you sit in meditation, bring his rupa, form, in front of your eyes. Along with this, chant any of his names you desire most. 
If we do this japa alone, without seeing his rupa, who will respond to you? Don't feel that I will get angry if you do not choose me as jana rupa for meditation. You have the freedom to choose the name and the form you desire most. All names and forms are mine. After seeing me or hearing me, there is no need for you to change from the earlier name or form that you are accustomed to. Swami did not stop at this. In April 1959, he was giving a discourse on the sands of the Chitravati and speaking on Buddha, the Bodhi Vriksha, and a suitable place for Tapasya. Suddenly, he ran his hands through the sands and materialized a copper plate about 15 to uh, 20 inches long. There were some known and unknown syllables inscribed on it. Swami showed it to all those who were present there and said, if this copper plate is buried under a tree and the sadhak meditates on this spot, he will progress much faster. On 29th June 1959, Swami buried this copper plate in the Tapovanam and planted a banyan tree on that spot. While doing so, he said, those yogis who have attained a specific stage in meditation will be mysteriously attracted to this spot. What would have been the reason for Swami to select a banyan tree as Dhyana Vriksha? Tree for meditation. Lord Shiva, in his Guru Rupa, is seen seated under a banyan tree, imparting knowledge to his disciples. Mahavishnu rests in Yoga Nidra on a banyan leaf during the pralaya, the devastating flood, and protects all the three worlds. Similarly, our Sanatana Dharma, which is a combination of several philosophies, can be compared to a banyan tree. The banyan tree has shoots emerging from its branches, which on reaching the ground go below as the roots, thus making this tree immortal. To date, millions of sadhaks have meditated under banyan trees and have experience yogic bliss. This is a story from the time after the Chana Vriksha was planted. Shirdi Amma, where she is none other than Pedda Bhuttu, was once going to Chana Vriksha for meditation. She saw Sri Raja Reddy returning from Tapovan. He asked Pedda Bhuttu, have you taken Swami's permission to meditate under the banyan tree? Paddhavotu told him that she had not taken permission, but she would do so. Once Paddhavotu was meditating under Jhana Vriksha around the uh, Brahma Muhurtam time, while in a deep meditative state, suddenly her eyes opened and she saw an unbelievable, wondrous sight. She saw several celestial nymphs moving in the sky. Above the Prashanti Mandir, beautiful in appearance, richly adorned with flowers, they were floating towards the east. She could clearly hear melodious musical sounds. On seeing them, Pedabotu guessed that they were divine residents of the Devaloka who had come down for Swami's darshan. Since she was a yogini, she was therefore blessed with such a soul-stirring experience while meditating under the holy banyan tree. In the fourth chapter and the fortieth verse of Bhagavad Gita, the Lord declares the ignorant 
the faithless, the doubting self goes to destruction. There is neither this world nor the other nor happiness for the doubter. Bhagavan Sri Krishna has thus explained in the Gita what happens to a person who always doubts. We are extremely fortunate to have Lord Sai Krishna among us today, who is constantly working towards removing our doubting tendencies. This is a story from 1959. A young man had come to Prashantalim from Madras, now in Chennai, for Swami's darshan. Swami called him to the first floor of the Prashanti Mandir. It was a moonlit night. In those days, sometimes, Swami used to enjoy having moonlight dinners with his devotees. This program was held on the terrace above Prashanti Mandir. Earlier, before the expansion of the Mandir, there was a terrace above the first floor. This young man was extremely happy for being a recipient of such grace. When he went to meet Swami, he asked the young man to touch him. The youth found Swami's body temperature very high, as in fever. Someone got a thermometer and checked the temperature. It was 104 degrees. Everyone realized the Swami had high fever and they were cons very concerned. But Swami was joyous, joyous as usual. He told this young man, in your house, in Madras, your mother was going to fall prey to a fire. While sitting her, my body temperature rose high, that's all. After five minutes, Swami asked for his body temperature to be checked again. And this time it was 96 degrees. Everyone was relieved and the dinner program went off smoothly. But the young man could not sleep all night. As he tossed and turned, only one thought troubled him. It was about his mother. How is she? Has she really suffered burns? Did Swami really go to Madras to save her? Is this true? Or is he making up a story? So on and so forth. His mind was engulfed in doubts. Next morning, he went to the post office and booked a train call to Madras. In those days, telecommunication was not as efficient as today. When the mother came on the line, he narrated the earlier night's incident to her. After hearing him out, she could not control her emotions. She sobbed as she told him, Yesterday, while I was doing puja in the shrine at home, my sari caught fire from the flame of the burning oil lamp. I frantically invoked Swami and in a few moments, miraculously, the fire was put out. She further asked her son, How is Swami? I hope his hands did not suffer burns while saving me. After hearing this from his mother, the young man felt ashamed for having doubted Swami. He returned to the ashram with an overpowering feeling of guilt. As he reached the mandir, he saw Swami waiting outside the door. Swami asked him, what did your mother say? Look here, see my hands? They did not get burnt at all. Only my body temperature rose high, that's all. The young man's doubts had been removed completely and he bowed down in reverence and touched Swami's feet. Swami smiled gently and patted him on his back. Thank you. We'll meet again.